Let's move on to variance, invariance, covariance. As we saw, the problem with self-supervised learning that we have to avoid one way or another is the fact that you have trivial solutions and then you need to avoid it. A constant is a solution when you are self-supervising yourself. And that's the easiest solution and the neural network is going to pick that. And therefore, we had to work really hard to avoid that. We had contrastive learning. We had clustering type of methods. We had uh, stop gradient and a prediction head. And this is another method, which is going to enforce it explicitly. So far, we were uh, perhaps sort of lucky with other methods, except for contrastive learning, that we were escaping the trivial solution. This one is going to enforce it in the loss function. You have an image, you, or an, a patch of images, and then you would uh, augment them in two different ways. Push them through your neural network. This is the feature extractor. These are your representations. Take your representations, push them through this H function, which is going to help you do some sort of metric learning. So you're giving more flexibility to the type of loss function that you can write here. You can write an easy loss function on the Z space, but then H is going to keep transforming your representations so that a simple loss function is enough at the end. This is actually what deep neural networks do in the end. Even for simple classification, you keep transforming your images from one layer to the next layer so that in the last layer, a simple logistic regression is going to do the classification. It's the same idea here. We keep massaging your representations so that a simple loss function is going to do the job at the last layer. Here I is an image, so don't think of it as an index. I stands for image. You have two transformations, perhaps flip your image left and right, or crop it, or play around with the color, saturation, etc. Rotate it perhaps. These are two different transformations. You apply them on your image, and that's going to give you two augmented images or two transformed images, which could be random crops or color distortions. Take those images, push them through your uh, feature extractor, which here is a CNN, it's a ResNet. And then take the output of F, push it through H, that's going to give you Z and Z prime. You can call H the expander. It doesn't really matter. And then in the end, because you pushed a mini batch of images inside your architecture, you are going to end up with a mini batch of representations. And let's say the mini batch size was n. This one is for the upper branch. This one is for the lower branch. And then you want z to match z prime. If you write down a simple mean squared error loss, things are going to collapse and things are going to be basically a constant. All of these z's are going to end up being the same, the same vector. And you want to explicitly avoid it. What can you do? You can look at the variance or standard deviation across the batch size. So you're computing the variance across the mini batch size. And then you want to have some variance. You want the vector from Z1 to be different from the vector from Z2. Basically, you want this matrix to have variance across the batch dimension. You want it to vary. How can you enforce it if your variance or the standard deviation is less than a hyperparameter that you choose? Then this term is going to be positive. The maximum of zero and something that is positive is going to be the positive thing. And you are penalizing your model because if you don't do that, the variance is going to keep going to zero. But if the variance is bigger than gamma, this term is going to be less than zero. And then your model is going to be happy. So you are keeping your variance across the batch dimension above a threshold. You're explicitly telling your model, don't pick up the trivial solution. Don't pick up a constant. You're doing it explicitly. The other one is you're going to compute the covariance matrix, again, across the uh, mini batch dimension. This is the exact formula for it. You're doing it across mini batch. And then you're going to add a covariance regularization. What you're doing here, this is all of the terms in your covariance matrix 
except for the diagonal. This is where i is equal is not equal to j, except for the diagonal. Why would you do that? Because you want to encourage the off-diagonal terms to go to zero. What does that mean? It means that you are decorrelating different dimensions in your z vector. You want this dimension of your z vector to be not correlated with the other dimension. You're sort of making them behave in an uncorrelated fashion. And this way you're encoding more information individually for each dimension or equivalently preventing them from encoding the same thing. We explain variance, we explain covariance. At the same time, you want things to be invariant to the different representations. These two images, they are augmented version of the same thing. Therefore, their representations should be similar in a mean squared error sense. So variance, invariance, covariance. This is invariance, this is covariance, and you want to keep the variance above a threshold. Now you can symmetrize things. Variance of Z, this is variance of Z prime. The only thing that is invariant, it is across the two different transformations on your images, is the invariance loss or the invariance portion of the loss. The rest of them, you can compute them individually for Z and Z prime. And then you do that across over, across all of your data and for different transformations. And here is where weak reg is going to end up in the end. It's one of the best methods when it comes to top one and top five under the linear evaluation paradigm, where you put a linear layer on top of these features. Why? And then train only the linear part while freezing the feature extractor. Any questions? Was everything clear? Okay, awesome.